So welcome to the panel discussion on new developments in treatment for, for bleeding disorders. Uh, it's truly an exciting time uh, in 2015 with products in the pipeline, new products being, being introduced into the market. The question we want to ask uh, our panelists today is, which of these products do you think are the most promising? What will be the big ga game changers in terms of care? We'll come back to that in a, at the end of our discussion, but first we want to explore what, what these new developments are. So one of the developments which has come along in the last few years is personalized prophylaxis, allowing the patient to get the right dose uh, at the right time of the right product. Uh, David Lillicrap, uh, researcher, clinician at Queen's University, um, how will this change hemophilia care? And are, are, are there barriers to its introduction? I think we're going to see some very major changes in the treatment of hemophilia, all of which are to the good. For the last couple of decades, we've treated um, essentially with uh, the clotting proteins uh, in a relatively straightforward fashion. Uh, now there's been an increased uptake of uh, prophylactic therapy which uh, in at least in developed countries is happening a lot but I think the array of choices that are beginning to enter the clinic now are going to mean that clinicians and patients need to be much more informed about those different choices and the personalization of uh, hemophilia care. So this is a radical change, all for the better, and it's going to need people to be um, knowledgeable and informed in a way that they haven't been really for the last two decades. Ted Tuddenham, uh, again a clinician researcher at the Royal Free Hospital in, in London, England. Uh, any comments on that? It's going to be a challenging time to choose amongst the multiple alternatives on offer. I think there must be something like 20 new molecules entering the arena of haemophilia treatment. But I do mention tailoring. We, we have done tailoring, actually, with the existing products, uh, or rather the ones that have been around for the last 10 years. And uh, patients have had an element, a large element of choice in that as well. But what will widen out now is the opportunity to choose amount and frequency to suit and still obtain very favorable trough levels. So that's, that's a big advantage in my eye from what's coming out now. Um, Glenn Pierce, interesting profile, a researcher, a physician, and also a person who had hemophilia. Prolonged half-life factor products are, have been introduced in the US. You've been involved in, 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 in some of that work. Uh, they'll soon be introduced in, in Europe and, and, and in Canada. These are being touted as the first fundamental change in efficacy since prior precipitate. Uh, are they a game changer? The development of the extended half-life products is a game changer. It is uh, a situation where choice needs to be made based upon the clinical data coming from the development of these products. Uh, so in the past, over the past 20 years, for instance, with recombinant factor eight products, they've been interchangeable. They work the same way, they are equally efficacious, they're equally safe. Uh, and so one could switch uh, and maintain the same regimen and not worry about uh, whether or not they were protected or not. Uh, with the development of the extended half-life products, they all, they all work by a slightly different mechanism to extend their half-life. Uh, and they all have slightly different half-lives. And so it's going to be important for us to go back to very personalized medicine and for patients to determine what works for them. That can be done in one of two ways. Either pharmacokinetic data can be obtained to allow one to determine what the PK is and what the half-life might be, uh, or that can be done the way it's been done in the past, empirically, where one would shift based upon the data that's in the product insert and then determine whether or not they're protected from bleeding. That's the basis of personalized medicine today. Uh, for factor products. If, if you're not covered by a particular dose regimen, then you've got the option of increasing the frequency of dosing or increasing the dose itself. So these products are being added to the panoply of, of products available. Will the, the older traditional products then still be available and perhaps uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a lower cost and, and, and more accessible to, to countries in the, in the developing world? 
uh, it's likely that the older products will continue to be accessible and available. Uh, and in fact, uh, if we look at what happened uh, as recombinant products got introduced into the marketplace 20 years ago, uh, the plasma-derived products dropped in price, uh, and many more were available within other markets that they had not traditionally been in. I would anticipate as the extended half-life products come onto the market, uh, they will um, displace the recombinant products over a period of years. Declan Noon, you're an informed patient. Are you excited about uh, these new standard half-life products? Uh, yeah, we're, we're very excited uh, about it in Ireland. We've done a lot of education with patients. We've had a lot of discussion around how they're going to be used, when they're going to be used. And some of the discussions that we're hearing from payers with new products in general is what patients will benefit from new drugs. And I, I can't see a, a, a patient group or a patient uh, section that won't benefit from these new drugs. So what would be the benefits to you, an extended half-life product to you or, or perhaps a, a, young, a young child in, in, in your organization? What do you, what do you see as the, the real benefits? So uh, to, to someone like me, I would see a, a, an increased benefit in relation to higher trough levels. So I would ideally like to maintain the uh, three times a week or a slightly higher dose and two times a week and, and have a higher uh, level to protect joints, uh, particularly as, as I get older. Whereas with the the parents, uh, the big benefit, uh, particularly around small babies and um, children who are really trying to, to come to terms with, with hemophilia, is not having to take it as often and protecting their veins and, and coming to terms with being protected on a balance without having to get too many infusions. Ted Tuddenham and David, and David Ullicrap, uh, as clinicians, are, are those the benefits you see, lower troughs, less frequency? Certainly having troughs that don't dip into the 2, 1 and less than 1 level, which we so often have had over past years with breakthrough bleeding rates in the 6 to 10 range, which actually for joint long-term health is, is a disaster. Getting away from that um, without having to go to heroic dose levels or very frequent infusion, which if some of our patients did, by the way, very successfully from the point of view of avoiding bleeding, but getting to that point on a once or twice, and, and in some of the longest half-lives of once a week, once a fortnight dosing, is a great step forward. And um, I applaud the efforts of all those who've worked so hard to generate these new products that enable that.